Well, we're going to begin this series called Heart Coach on parenting, and when I think about parenting, one of those sayings that comes to mind is, be careful what you ask for. Um, Being a parent can be the most amazing and most perplexing thing you've ever experienced. There are some parents who do find themselves thinking at times, what was I thinking when I asked for a child? So um, I'm certainly not the perfect parent, and I don't even pretend to be that. But I do think it's important for us to focus on the family. And so to be honest, every parent feels overwhelmed at times. And if you haven't yet and you're a parent, you will feel overwhelmed at some point. And, uh, you know, here are several tests that you might want to take if you don't have kids yet and you're thinking about having kids. Um, here's, here's some tests that you can take and see if you can survive these kids, these tests before you have kids. Uh, the first one is the messy test. And that is you take a whole jar of peanut butter, spread it all over the couch, and uh, you take candy and goldfish and you stick them down deep in the couch and you let it sit there for a whole year. And if you can pass that test, you might just be ready to be a parent. (laughs) Or you take, there's the grocery store test. Uh, You don't have kids, so you've got to buy a couple of little goats, right? And you take them to the store... And you have to try to keep them from taking things off the shelves and eating them. And when you get to the end, you have to pay for all the damages, too. So if you can pass the grocery store test, you might be ready. Or there's the dressing test. You take an adult, healthy, mad octopus, and you take a little bag, a little net bag, and you try to stuff him all in there. And if you can pass the dressing test, you might be ready for a kid. All right. Or there's the feeding test. You take like a milk jug, cut a hole in the bottom, tie it to a string to the ceiling, swing it back and forth, get some gooey cereal, and uh, pretend you're an airplane and try and stick all of that cereal into the swinging mouth that goes by you. All right. And about three quarters of the way through, you need to dump the rest of it on the floor. If you can pass the feeding test, you might be ready. Or there's the night test. You get a little bag, put eight to twelve. Uh, Pounds of sand in there, soak it with water, carry it around from 8 till 9 p.m., kind of waltz, put it down in the crib, and then uh, at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, you uh, wake it up and uh, you sing songs to it, every song that you know about a dozen times, all the way until it's 4 a.m., and then you put it back down in the crib and uh, set your alarm for 5 o'clock a.m., and you get up and you make breakfast, and you do this for five years in a row, all right? Maybe then you're ready for parenting. The point is, is that um, kids can be awfully challenging, and it's an incredible experience at the same time to be a parent. I just ran across this uh, from a mom this week who just put this out on her blog, uh, these pictures. She said, I want to remember, remember that sparkle in her eye, that thinking, that thinking look that she gives me when we're face to face, how she watches every move I make as I go about the room. Or this picture. I want to remember the fluff of her hair, the soft wave that she gets from her daddy. You can tell that's not my kid. All right. <laughs> the wispy hairs that cover the top of her forehead. Or this picture. I want to remember those lips, the lips that I kiss nearly a hundred times each day. How her baby breath truly does smell like a flower. Or I want to remember this smile, how she can do it with her eyes the way her upper lip protrudes and the cooing sound that she makes, the intense joy that wells up inside of me every time. Or this picture. I want to remember the miracle of little feet, the miracle of life that I see when I gaze into her eyes, when her head's on my shoulder and I whisper in her ear, the miracle I feel when I cradle her in the crook of my arm, And the miracle that screams the goodness of God. And everybody said, aww. The point is that it's an amazing thing to be a parent. Well, it's awfully challenging at the same time. So how do we do this thing called parenting? Today we begin a series called Heart Coach. These messages are based on the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. And we're going to explore how we cooperate with God in his heart-based approach to life transformation. So that means parents and non-parents are going to be finding practical help for relationships and spiritual wisdom for our relationship with God as we go through. In each message, 
we'll focus on one of six milestones. You might remember these from last fall in the Frames message series that parents can use to help focus their parenting. You know, every child is created in God's image and created for a relationship with God in a personal way. By the way, did you hear about the child, little guy who uh, sang the Lord's Prayer and he said, Our Father who art in heaven, herald be thy name, he says. And it's just amazing sometimes what comes out of a child's mouth, isn't it? And God has designed every person, every child, for a relationship with him. And so we want to help parents just focus their parenting. We uh, introduced these milestones last year. If you look down the left column, birth, new birth, preparing for adolescence, commitment to purity, world changers, and the blessing are in that column. And Shalom has an aim to collaborate with parents by resourcing them as faith coaches, as their children. Now, that's not all we do. We don't only work with parents, but this is something that we want to give some emphasis to. And in a world that is extremely busy, full of everyone trying to get your attention with their ideas and sell you their products and games and entertainment, and a world that pressures your child to live an ungodly life, you know what? A parent needs a little bit of help. And we just want to be helpful to one another as well as just offer you resources so as a church, that's what we're up to, and this will help us stay focused on preparing for all of us to meet God someday. Today we're going to look at the first milestone, birth, and uh, the church event that goes along with that called child dedication. I want to share with you a story of a child dedication from 1 Samuel. What is a child dedication? Well, a child dedication is a ceremony in which the parents bring their infant, it doesn't have to be an infant, their child it could be, before the Lord and before the church, and the pastor asks the parents if they are going to, if they're going to commit to raising their child in the ways of the Lord. And then the pastor asks the church, are you going to help these parents to do that? So there's a community sense of help and encouragement that comes from the church. But the most important part of the child dedication is the commitment that the parents make. The parents make a commitment to be a faith coach for that child. That is, they dedicate themselves to coaching their child to toward faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you dedicate your child, you commit to teaching that child about the Word of God and about Jesus and about salvation. You commit to helping your child stay pure and live an ungodly life or, or, and protected from an ungodly world. And you commit to challenging your child to make a difference in this world for Christ and a lot of other things. And, and today we want to focus on one of those other things, which is a commitment to pray for your child. Parents need to focus on these milestones, but the truth is, is that all of this that we're talking about is a matter of heart change. So we need to learn to pray to the one who can change the heart. Before we read our text, I want to just give you the back story here. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 1, if you want to turn there in your Bibles. But the backstory of 1 Samuel is it's, uh, the main character of all of this First and Second Samuel, these two books, is a man named Samuel. And uh, how he was born miraculously is what is the topic of chapter 1. And what God's purpose for his life is, is also the, what's shared in chapter 1. His mother Hannah, the, by the time we pick up this story in chapter 1, is infertile. She has prayed for years to have a baby. And God has not heard her word, her prayer. And finally, she cries out to God and makes a vow. And she says in 1 Samuel 1, verse 11, this right here. She made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. Now, this is a turning point for Elkanah, the daddy, and Hannah, the mommy. And, and a very exciting answer comes, 1 Samuel 1, verses 19 and 20. Early the next morning, they arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with his, Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, I asked the Lord him because I asked the Lord for him. So the name Samuel from the Hebrew actually means God hears, God listens. And that's exactly why he received his name. Hannah says, 
because I asked the Lord for him. And what she means is that God heard her prayer. What follows is our text for today. In this text, the parents actually take Samuel to present him before the Lord, and it's the story of a child dedication. So let's look at verses 21 through 28, 1 Samuel chapter 1, 21 through 28. 28. When the man Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her, after the boys weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, Elkanah, her husband told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bowl, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bowl, they brought the boy to Eli. And she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child. And the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. What we see in our text is Elkanah and Hannah, two parents, dedicating their child Samuel to God. So when we dedicate a child, we have a special time of prayer. And this is only the beginning of a commitment to pray through the life of that child. The story shows us Three ideas, at least, that encourage us to go deeper into prayer, understanding it and, and applying prayer in our relationship with God. So let's, go, let's look at these. Number one, the first encouragement is this. We pray because it is God that changes the heart. Elkanah is a great example of trusting God to change the heart. Verses 21 and 22 read this. When the man Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice... To the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boys weaned, I will, I will take him, present him before the Lord, and we will live there. he will live there always. Now, a vow is a promise. And the promise was originally Hannah's. Uh, God, if you give me a boy, I'll give him back to you. He'll serve you all the days of his life. But the system in those days is that a vow could be nullified by a husband or a father if, if it was deemed as a foolish vow. So a wife or a daughter or a son could make a vow before the Lord. Husband or father hears that and says, listen, uh, that's a foolish vow. You should not make that. And it would be nullified before the Lord. That's in Numbers 30, verses 1 through 8. Um, and in a sense, then, when the husband says nothing in this case, he hears Hannah, his wife, make this vow. He says nothing, and it becomes his vow as well. And so they both have committed to this vow and so that's why it says in verse 21, Elkanah went up to Shiloh to fulfill his vow. It was his vow at, as well as hers. But there's more. Look at what he says in verse 23. He says, do what seems best to you. Elkanah, her husband, told her, stay here until you've weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Elkanah agrees with his wife, she should stay home. Now, in those days, uh, it was only the men that really had to go up to the feasts. Uh, it was okay for others to stay home, but the men were required to do that, and, and uh, obviously Hannah loved to do that, but she wants to stay home until this little guy is ready to be delivered to the priest there. But, but Elkanah has a concern. They have made a huge promise to the Lord. They're going to take this little guy and leave him with Eli and... Let somebody else raise him. He's going to be given to the Lord all the days of his life. And it appears that Elkanah was concerned that they as parents would be able to actually follow through on that promise. And so before he leaves, he prays a prayer in the conversation with his wife. See, a prayer doesn't always have to be fold your hands and close your eyes, right? It can be right out loud as you're talking with somebody as well, because God's right there in the conversation anyway. And he says in verse 23, only may the Lord make good his word. In other words, may God move in our hearts to keep us faithful to our promise. 
You see, the reason that we pray to God is because God is the ultimate heart coach. We pray because our hearts need to be adjusted, and we pray because only God can change the heart of a child or any human being. Every relationship is a matter of the heart. One parent said it this way, my kids hated me. They were disrespectful and hurtful. My spouse didn't know what to do and withdrew. I couldn't imagine this for the next 10 years. The solution began in the heart. This person says, I prayed that God would change my heart, and he did. Then I began to look beyond behavior and see the hearts of my kids. Step by step, I did what I could to help my children change their hearts. At first, progress was slow. But a year later, the daily battlefield has changed to enjoyable relationships. We still have to correct and set limits, but by focusing on our kids' hearts, we avoid the battles of the past. See, it's a matter of the heart. You know, sometimes we think we're the Holy Spirit, and we can thud somebody hard enough so that they change their heart. It doesn't work that way. And, and that's why we pray to God. It's amazing what happens when a parent prays to God. A second word of encouragement to go deeper in prayer. We pray in order to understand what God wants. Verse, uh, verse 11, go back a little bit in chapter 1 there. She made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. So she has prayed for years, for years. God, give me a son. God, give me a child. God, do something. All right? And notice the length now of the promise she makes. I'm going to give him back to you now, God. This is my vow. She she changes her prayer. I'm going to give him back to you all the days of his life. And notice the promise. No razor will ever come on his head. Uh, This means that this little guy would grow up to be the scruffiest, uh, long hairs guy that you could ever know. I mean, he'd make the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest beard or something like that. You know, and all the moms of middle school boys right now are saying, oh, why did you have to say that, Pastor Rick? But what, what she really promised was that Samuel would be a Nazarite. Not a Nazarene, but a Nazarite. That is, someone devoted to live for God and to be godly. And so in that day, it was like uh, wearing a t-shirt that says, uh, I made a promise to live for God, or I will follow Jesus, or something like that. Anybody who saw Samuel, saw the beard, saw the hair, said, that man is a Nazarite vow. He's going to live for God. And uh, that's what that vow was for. Now, if maybe you're struggling with infertility, please do not think that this is exactly what God wants you to pray, okay? Um, there's no real formula to prayer. That's the, one of the um, confusions that happen, happens when we memorize prayers and just pray them by memory. Is we think somehow that's a formula and it's going to work. And I'm going to get what I want. There's no real formula. It, it, prayer is not as though we can pray the right words and finally God kicks in and does his part. Okay, it's not that way. It's not like, you know, taking your prayer quarters and putting them in the candy machine and pressing the button and getting out of there what you want. It's not a formula. It's it's a communication with God. It's not even just talking to God. It's a communication with God. So you don't need to role play because God totally knows everything about you and a lot more than you know about you. You don't need to come to God and say, oh, thou most wonderful God over all the universe. I prayest that thou wouldest hear me, you know? I mean, I don't understand it, and and I'm sure it's probably for good reasons, but some people just break into King James English when they pray, you know? I'm like, why? You know, and maybe it's good for them. That's no problem, but but you do not need to role play for God when you pray. It's just, he knows totally everything about you. You need to have respect when you come to God, of course, but prayer is a conversation in which the Holy Spirit prompts us what to pray. So prayer's about listening and talking and listening and talking with God. Hannah's prayer was one of those moments she had moved from praying the prayer that she thought she should pray, God, I need a child, 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 for years, 
And all of a sudden, she's moving to a prayer that God wants to answer. God, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you. You might, you know, think, oh, I need to pray that my daughter is the most popular c- girl in school, or I need to pray that my son figures out a career that's going to make him wealthy or at least able to feed his family or something like that. Or, you know, and we have a thousand different ways to pray what we think needs to be done. But Hannah moved from thinking, you know, praying what she thought needed to happen to praying the prayer that God really wanted to answer. So it's a, it's a communication event. And sometimes that takes years. It really does. Don't be discouraged if your deepest concern is yet unanswered by God. So how about you? Are your prayers your ideas or are your prayers God's ideas? That's a really important question. In fact, uh, I just created a little prayer guide for parents. Anybody can use them really, but uh, it's this little insert in your worship folder. If you would pull that out just for a second, I created seven days of prayer that you can just pick up any day. Day one, day two is how they're marked. So you can start and just pray these prayers. I'll give you an example. The first one is uh, from Psalm 73. We will tell them, the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power and the wonders He has done. And the prayer goes, Lord, may my children hear from me the amazing things that you have done so that they will know you. Amen. Right? An example of how to use the Bible and turn it into a prayer. And that's what these all are. You can pray the Scripture as you read it. Now, maybe you're not a parent. Same principle. You can still pray the Scripture for your life and for the people around you. In fact, let me recommend this acronym, A-C-T-S. Let's go to that next slide there, Kevin. Um, the, The first letter is A, which means adoration, where we adore or praise and thank God. And the second letter is C, confess sins. God... I've been belligerent, I've been proud, I've been mean, whatever, right? Um, I've not loved the way you want me to love, that kind of thing. And you're confessing sin. The third letter is T. Tell him, tell God your worries and what you need. Okay, this is a little different than the traditional ACTS acronym, all right? Right here, it breaks off. Tell God what you need. Tell him what you're afraid of. Tell him. Unburden yourself with that. And then the S is, Share and show. Pray that God will direct you and help you share and show the love of Christ to others. A-C-T-S. Maybe you want to write that down. It's a really helpful little acronym. A-C-T-S. All right. Number three, uh, another encouragement to pray. We pray because God actually answers prayer. Verses 25 through 28. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli. She said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, Eli is the priest there, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. In verse 27, Hannah says, I prayed for this child, and the Lord granted me what I asked of him. Verse 20 is similar. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. In other words, she is celebrating something really important for us to know. She finally brings Samuel, he's probably about three years old or so, to Eli the priest, and she's going to leave her little boy there for someone else to raise. She'll see him only a few times a year. This is a very difficult moment for parents. In fact, uh, on Facebook, as school was approaching, I saw a few moms write about, you know, letting go of their kids. You know, one child was going off to first grade and would be spending more time in school than at home during the day, and, and the mom was having a rough time with that. You know, it's, it's not easy. And then you picture Hannah, this is her only child, and she is letting him go. That's a pretty hard moment. But remember what Elkanah prayed, God, only may God confirm his word. So he prayed. In other words, he was praying, God, transform my heart and Hannah's heart in such a way that when that moment comes and we have to leave this little guy there, we will have the strength and the joy and the peace to do what you call us to do. And Hannah is 
praising God and celebrating, my God answers prayer. Instead of saying, oh, I'm going to miss you so much, you know. She could have been doing that easily enough. She celebrates the grace of God. Now remember her story. Year after year after year after year, praying the same thing. Nothing changes. Finally, she aligns with God, gets on his team. Boom. God starts moving. And she is full of praise. Because God answers prayer. You can't see it in verse 28, the English translation in NIV reads, uh, now I give him to the Lord. The ESV reads, now I have lent him to the Lord. Actually, the original Hebrew word is difficult to translate into English. Um, In a way, she's actually saying this, I asked successfully to the Lord. That's what she's saying. And in Exodus 12, 36, it's the only other time that this word is used in a similar form in the Hebrew, and uh, it's, it, you can see it right here. It says, so the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. There's that word that she uses. So in verse 20, Hannah says, I named him Samuel because I asked the Lord for him. In verse 27, I prayed for this child. The Lord granted me what I asked of him. Verse 28, she's basically saying, I successfully asked for my child to live for the Lord. You see her point? Wow! My God heard me, little old me. He heard my prayer. And she is off the charts celebrating the grace and the favor of God. Because God really does answer prayer. You thought about how amazing that is? (laughs) We can't see God. And any moment, we can pray. And He hears everything. He even, at times, answers prayer when we get in line with what He's up to. Isn't that amazing? Ask yourself, what is my deepest hurt and wound, or what is my greatest longing, or what do I really desire? Do you think that God could answer your prayer? This is amazing. This is truly awesome. Forgive me for being so simple, but this is amazing. Is there any faith growing inside of you? says, I just need to connect with God in prayer. Listen to that faith. Listen to it. Let's uh, read what we've learned, these encouragements to pray. Would you read these out loud with me? We pray because it is God that changes the heart. I'm going to ask the team to come while we're doing this. Number two, we pray in order to understand what God wants. And number three, we pray because God actually answers prayer. Hey guys, would you pray with me just for a moment? Father God, we give you praise and honor because God, you are a God who hears. You are a God who is with us here even now. Lord God, when we align with your purposes, you do amazing things. So we just give you praise. And give it, make it our attention, intention, Lord, to talk with you, to listen to you. Well, Lord, help us to be good listeners. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friend, if you would like to receive prayer after the service, there will be some folks up here that you can come and pray with, and they'll pray with you as well. And so I encourage you to whatever your concern might be, just to make your way to the front and receive prayer. Also, um, just in response to the message today, I want to encourage you to take these home and and implement these as a way to go ahead and pray for the people around you. Um, If you're interested in a child dedication 
and so uh, you've never done that. Um, we're planning one on Christmas Day, which is a Sunday, so December 25th. So go ahead and talk to Pastor Adam or myself, and we'll help you get ready for that moment as well. Next week, uh, we're going to talk about um, the second milestone, which is new birth, and helping children, or really anybody, to understand the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, so I invite you to come back. I also invite you, if, if somehow you just feel really nourished in your soul today, think about who you could invite that uh, could receive that blessing as well, and uh, go ahead and, and invite that person. So um, don't forget, we've got a little celebration for Adam and Jenny, so you guys can go on out. Jenny, if you want to go out and take your kids too and uh, make your way out, and as they go... Let's uh, receive the benediction for the end of our service here today from Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which will never be shaken. It can never be moved. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. May you go this week in that kind of faith in the Lord. God bless you. Have a great week.